Um, I'm asked to talk, uh, say something about where I see the church going. Um, I'm going to hope that we might have a conversation. I'll lay out some of the things I think are going to need our attention and our cooperation in the coming years, and then I would hope for some interchange and some feedback and pushback, even. Um, we have begun to proclaim the five marks of mission as an image for how we, how we share in God's mission in the world. Are you all reasonably familiar with those? Um, no, okay. Um, okay. Five Anglican marks of mission adopted by Anglican communion bodies some 25, 30 years ago. They, they set out a framework for what it means to participate in God's mission that's bigger than any of us can do alone, which is one of their pieces of genius, um, and that requires our interdependence um, and cooperation, which is an image of the body of Christ. Five marks of mission, it's a digital model, it's easy to remember. Um, proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, that vision for a healed world, the second one is to teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. You can Google five Anglican marks of mission and find the website. You need to go back to this. So the vision of the kingdom of God, teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. The third one is to respond to human need with loving service. The fourth one is to confront injustice and to seek to confront violence, to transform the injustices of this world, to seek peace and reconciliation. And the last one is about caring for the earth. Caring for the earth. Um, you will see them reflected generally in our baptismal covenant. There's nothing concrete in our baptismal covenant about caring for the earth. And I think that's a result of the particular time in which this prayer book was written. Um, those, those require our networking, our interdependence, our reliance on the gifts of the whole body of Christ to attend to. They call us outside of ourselves. If you think about it, only the second one is primarily root, rooted in, within the life of congregations. The others all call us out into the larger world. Um, so it's not just church for the sake of church, it's church for, on behalf of God's world. Um, we framed our church-wide budget around the five marks of mission in this triennium. Um, I think they have staying power, and I think they're going to continue to call us to mutual encounter and engagement in God's mission in the years to come. Maybe we could look at what the future is going to bring through this lens. The good news of the kingdom is about a world of peace and justice. It's about the kingdom come on earth, on earth, as it is in heaven. Uh, there, there's still a strand of Christianity that only talks about the afterlife, that only talks about uh, high in the sky and the great by and by. Um, but I believe Jesus was primarily about realizing a society that treated everyone as the image of God. That's a vision that's not heard everywhere in the world today. That's a vision, a call to transformation that really motivates Christians and many other people of faith. I think we're going to see more and more um, work needed and words proclaimed and vision cast that invites a hungry world into participating in that vision, in that great dream for shalom. That's who we're meant to be, catalysts for that vision realized in this world. And yes, we won't get there before the second coming, but that doesn't mean we're not supposed to be about that work. Um, the second one, teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. It's the work of the 
church in its local expression more than anything else. It's about um, Sunday school, and it's also about the kind of work like this that goes on in the world. The new and creative initiatives like Beer with Hymns, <laughs> <laughs> or Theology on Tap, or Popcorn Theology. It's a, it's a, a movement of the faithful out into the world to engage people with those deep, urgent questions of meaning, mission, vocation. We're already seeing good experiments realized in that. And, you know, this is not new. This is Jesus going to dinner with Zacchaeus. Um, this is Martin Luther using bar tunes to tell theology. <laughs> right? Right? Uh, we simply have to continue to risk new ways, try new ways of being present. This is messy church. If you don't know about messy church, it's, a, it's a, essentially a catechesis program for little ones with a parent to come and make a mess, an art project, eat together, pray together in a way that's appropriate for three or four year olds. And adults overhearing the gospel. <laughs> um, it's going to take all our creativity. Um, this is what YASC is about, Young Adult Service Corps, sending young adults to another part of the Anglican community to spend the year living in relationship, and to be uh, a messenger of that good news, and to form and nurture the faith of others simply by the presence. This is the Episcopal Service Corps, young adults living together in community for a year, in vocational discernment and service in the community. This is, this is new monastic formations. <laughs> <laughs> Temporary, fixed term, mobile. It's new ways of nurturing, forming, encouraging, the life and growth of faith in human beings and communities. Third one, third mark of mission, responding to human need through loving service. <clears throat> this is the ancient corporal works of mercy, feeding people, visiting the sick, going into prisons. Um, it's about halfway houses and re-entry programs for people released from prison. Uh, it's also, I think, connected to the fourth one, in particular about this one, it's about responding to the mass incarceration of young men of color. It's responding to the for-profit prison industry. It's responding to need in the world around us. It's a matter of congregations getting out of their pews to listen to the hunger and need in their communities, and then figuring out where their gifts can answer that need and hunger. It's as ancient as our faith. The fourth one, transforming structures of injustice and countering violence, seeking reconciliation. It's the peacemaking work of the gospel. It's a building a society of justice that has a place for all people and affirms their dignity, respects their dignity. Uh, it's saying no to increased militarization, frankly. It's seeking peaceful modes of reconciliation first. It's equipping Christians to be reconcilers in their daily lives. And it starts with kindergartners and before. You know, talking with some students yesterday afternoon, we, we began to talk about the, the challenge of a child who grows up never having a trustworthy environment, never knowing that very concrete form of love. An environment like that is what produces sociopaths because the brain has been malformed. 
our ability to produce peace begins with the birth of a child and ensuring that that child has a nurturing environment. That's the task and responsibility of all of us. Fifth mark of mission, caring for the earth. Lots and lots of creative work is going on at the very local level, uh, planting gardens, feeding people in the neighborhood with the produce of those gardens, attending to the energy use in the buildings we inhabit, uh, in the vehicles we use for transportation, consciousness about how we eat, because the food we eat uh, has an impact on fuel use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the way we use resources here affects the ability of people in sub-Saharan Africa to grow food or to have enough food to eat. You know, one of the blessings, if you will, of the reduction in the price of oil is that we're no longer planting so much corn to make ethanol here. And therefore, maize is what they call corn in Africa is affordable for food again. We're interconnected in ways that we don't recognize most of the time. The great challenge, challenges facing us as the world warms are going to confront us with these realities more and more. The Episcopal Church is hosting a church-wide webcast in April about the crisis of climate change, and anybody can participate, and it's often more helpful if you gather a group in your local place to watch it and discuss it locally. And the advertising about that will be going out very shortly. Uh, that's a snapshot. We're going to be experimenting, I hope, uh, including with this thing. <laughs> um, they're no longer new. <laughs> our, our faith lives because we continually re-examine and reinterpret it. And learn how to tell the old, old stories in the forms that are alive in our local contexts. You know, if you remember when Gregory sent Augustine to England all those many centuries ago, he said, take the, take the best of what you have and bless the best of what you find. Bless the best of what you find. That's, a, that's kind of a, the DNA of Anglicanism in terms of ordered freedom. We've got a tradition, but it has to be continually reinterpreted and retold in local language and forms. So, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> yes, the diaconate. The diaconate, yes. Any particular question, concern, um, hope? Where do you see growing? Where do I see the diaconate growing? Um, I'm, I'm seeing it expanding across the Episcopal Church. Uh, the piece I haven't seen is really the beginning of a youthful diaconate. Um, I yes. often see the diaconate as, a, as something that is available and thought about um, at middle age and beyond. And deacons are an enormous blessing in our church because they connect the inside and the outside. They get us out of the pews and into the world. Um, they motivate people to examine the gifts they have and to listen for those hungers outside the local community. There are a lot of contexts we don't necessarily get into. Um, colleges, uh, the young adult community that's disconnected from church. Um, we have to have deacons in all of those places. But it's going to take the insight and discernment of people intentionally looking for the gifts of the diaconate in teenagers. 
I, I, I would hope that we might begin to engage them with some fervor. With some fervor. We need more deacons, and we need them in more places. And there was a Bishop. Yes. Um, how do you see the church moving forward in developing um, resources for foster care, adoption, um, care for children with autism, and those sort of specialities? Our parish um, in, in Lewis has a tremendous growth in children with autism because we're not a we're not a fussy church when it comes to we're used to boys being boys. And so we have families joining with boys who are saying it's comfortable for us. We're not welcome other places. How does the church build on that? It's this is you know a small parish in a small diocese in a small state. How do how does the national church start to build on that? I think it's a trend that we are seeing more and more need for. It is. Could you hear in the back? Okay. Uh, particularly about autism, I know that there is a, a significant movement across the Episcopal Church to develop um, Sunday school curricula and intentional practices to make congregations welcoming to autistic children and their parents, as well as children with other kinds of learning challenges and disabilities. Um, that kind of network simply needs to be fostered and increased. Uh, we've got one person, uh, part-time, working on childhood-related uh, curricular resources. I'm happy to connect you with that resource, but frankly, Facebook might be a better alternative. Um, it's the networking that we're pushing that's, that's the way I think people with those needs um, connect, connect to the resources. Um, speak to me afterward, and I will give you the name of the person to, to talk to. But put something out there. Um, ask for others who are We're doing it. it. We're fantastic. doing it already. Fantastic. Um, thanks to wonderful mm -hmm. clergy leadership. Mm -hmm. But what we're not seeing is it moving beyond our parish? Yes. I mean, we see other parishes, and, and we discuss with other parishes, parents discuss with other parishes, what's happening. And the churches, the, particularly the, the Episcopal churches, that are growing in families, are growing in these areas, are growing in the, the children who are disenfranchised. Not, not the parents who are disenfranchised, but the children who are being disenfranchised. And that's the question I have. Where is the church, the national church, moving to address ch disenfranchised children? The international church and the Episcopal church is international. And the, we adopted something called the Children's Charter mm -hmm. a number of years ago mm -hmm. that identified the principles that you're expressing in concrete realities. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one way in which we have tried to respond. We have um, developed curricula in Spanish for contexts that have not had ad adequate access to effective Episcopal curricula. But we are not working at present in particular ways other than that that are focused yes. on children. Yes. Um, and yes. with children come parents. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and come people who need. Yeah. 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 Thank you. It's a challenge. It's a challenge, and it's a challenge I hear from you. Thank you. Uh, recognizing that there are many moments when we recognize faith, and faith propels us forward, mm -hmm. which then becomes a vision that, that, that's expressed so eloquently. Can you share with us one of your favorite, or a moment that you cherish, where that sense of faith and call came into your life, and that propelled you forward to your ministry? It's a C.O.M. question. I would give you a transition. I know what I said. Three people in my congregation, while I was an oceanographer, asked me if I'd ever thought about being a priest. 
I hadn't. When I was growing up, girls could sing in the choir or assist with the altar guild. And I don't sing very well. <laughs> it was a shocking enough encounter that I went and spent some time in discernment with the rector of the parish. Five years later, we came to the conclusion that the, at the very least the time wasn't right, and my husband was horrified by the idea. <laughs> <laughs> he married a scientist, not a priest. <laughs> but five years later, uh, another uh, a subsequent priest in that congregation asked me to preach on a Sunday when the clergy were to be at the diocesan convention. It was right before the first war in the Gulf started. That experience, preparing to do it and listening to people afterward, finally let me say yes. And I went to seminary the next fall. Sometimes it takes some of us a long time to hear. I'll come back here and then I'll come back Can you give us your vision for um, seminary education? What you would like to see it be? Oh. Let me, let me take the uh, topic of theological education. Uh, we need a mixed economy, a variety of modes of theological education, and the church needs it to be accessible to all who are hungry for it. Uh, all baptized Christians, uh, those who might be ordained, those who are ordained, uh, we need a variety. What we have now in terms of residential seminary education is, uh, in, in many cases, wonderful, but it requires three years of displacement of people who are often married or with families, um, whose partner is usually working to help support the family, and display, that displacement can be an enormous challenge. It also requires the investment of uh, $100,000 or more. Many young adults who begin to discern a need for that kind of theological education come already with educational debt. If you add to that educational debt from a residential seminary of the traditional kind, uh, frankly, many of those people are unemployable in 95% of the positions that are available in the church as priests. They cannot earn enough to pay their debt. Um, that said, there are a number of diocesan and regional uh, theological education programs that are developing <coughs> to train people for ordination, both as deacons and priests, that don't require that kind of displacement or that kind of financial investment. We have too many seminaries. Uh, they cost too much. Uh, we have an abundance of faculty that could be shared uh, between the seminaries. I hope that 20 years from now we have the appropriate number of seminaries and theological education that is available to anyone who needs it, regardless of their <coughs> intended vocation or the cost. Uh, at this point, um, Virginia Seminary can, will accept almost anyone without regard to need and provide the funds that are needed. Sewanee, I think, can do that as well. The others cannot. The others cannot. Um, it's a challenge for all of the mainline denominations at this point. Same, same challenge. Uh, I think our future is going to look a lot more ecumenical, not just in terms of theological education, but in terms of lived congregational life. Uh, we have full communion partners in the Evangelical Lutherans and in the Moravians, and increasingly congregations are being served by clergy of the other tradition, another tradition. I think we're going to see more of that. Uh, there are even a few places where Presbyterians and Episcopalians are playing together. Uh, <laughs> and I think even before that, we will see uh, more partnership with the Methodists. Um, we understand the world in many of the same ways. Um, our gospel is the same. It's our rules that are different. <laughs> our rules are different. But an educated Christian
Christian, particularly an Anglican Episcopalian, that's pretty normal. We have we have um, closeted Presbyterians and Methodists and <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we we understand the blessing of that kind of diversity and the creative possi possibility that it can bring. Um, so I, I think we need leadership, both clergy and lay, who are trained to think in that kind of ecumenical way. Firmly understanding and valuing their Anglican heritage, able to express it boldly in dialogue with other strands of the Catholic faith. But, but change is hard, especially at the seminary level. It's hard. <laughs> We've done it this way for oh, 150 years. It's hard. But it's coming. It's coming. I just hope it comes before those resources are gone and lost. Can you say something about why the average Episcopal congregation member should care about what the task force for reimagining the church is doing? Oh. Well, for that kind of reason, exactly. Uh, theological education is a piece of it. How we make our decisions is a piece of it. Uh, one of their proposals is for a unicameral uh, general convention, which means the bishops and deputies meet together, discuss things together, and vote in the same room. Uh, again, that's change, and it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge, and some people will think that their, their you know, preserve of um, identity or power or um, ability to change things is going to be challenged in that. Uh, I think God is always calling us to examine who we are and how we do things and to see what's needed in this age. I think that also might be an invitation for much greater grassroots involvement in the decisions that we make at a church wide level. It's an opportunity, given the connectivity we have today, um, to poll people, to, to get conversations going across the church and not only with the you know, thousand people who come to general convention to vote. Uh, I think that for reasons we, I talked about a little earlier in terms of the way faith communities may form, you know, we're going to have fewer buildings 25 years from now. They're going to be used differently. Congregations or faith communities are going to gather in different ways and maybe at different times in the week. Uh, we need more flexibility in our system about how to recognize those and even how to count. You know, our, our measures of growth and diminishment are based on how many people sit in these pews on Sunday morning. When we know that not as many people come every Sunday of the month, um, some of them come on Saturday night, which we usually count, some of them come on Wednesday morning, which we don't count. We need other ways of thinking about what the life of a Christian community looks like and the impact it has on the world around it. What if we counted instead how many lives we've touched this week as a community? And maybe we'd have to count all the students that a teacher in that parish works with. Um, we've got to use our imaginations. It may already be addressed by your previous comments. It's kind of related to Ruth's question and comes out of the Trek mm -hmm. report um, about looking at our buildings and the way we use them and the way we see them and possibly uh, expanding our repertoire of what they're used for. And as a young person, I remember the canons having distinctions amongst organized Christian communities. There were preaching stations, there were organized missions, and there were parishes. And for all that was detracting about that, because of the hierarchy you know, of, of organizations, one of the things that helped us to do was to understand what we were there for, like a preaching station, you know, or an organized mission, that sort of thing. And 
I wonder in your travels if you see unique, <coughs> helpful ways that local expressions of Christianity are identifying themselves and, and using their buildings to help us preach the gospel? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question that could go in a variety of directions. I think one of the things the church has learned in the last you know, eight or ten years uh, has come out of grief. In the dioceses where the leaders left uh, and people were kicked out of their ancestral homes, um, they discovered they could do church uh, in a new way. That they, you know, as much as they grieved leaving those buildings, uh, they could bring their box on Sunday morning and set up an altar and worship together and then go out into the community to be Christ's body in that place. Wow. Don't have to repair the roof. But that's exactly right. <laughs> um, in Wichita Falls, um, when that church in Texas, in Fort Worth, got kicked out of its building, they started worshiping in um, another building that they rented for a couple hours on Sunday morning, and they discovered um, that their finances looked very different. <laughs> and they said very soon after that, um, we're going to feed 5,000 people in the next five months. And they did it. You know, way smaller than the body gathered here. You know, kind of this much. <laughs> this many people did that. They thought differently about who they were as a part of the body of Christ. Um, increasingly, congregations who build new buildings are saying, how are we going to use this the rest of the week? This can't just be for Sunday morning. This has got to be a school or a community center or a welcome center for a particular kind of ministry. Um, this very place is a wonderful example of that. And in, I had this week two other um, diocesan offices are receiving new addresses because they've done something. They've moved into a new space that works differently. Um, that's happening all over the place. It's exciting. It is exciting. It's really exciting. Yeah. Um, I had the pleasure of going up and attending an Anglican Women's Organization luncheon uh -huh. uh, last year. And I know every February of the UN. Yes. Could you say a little yes. bit? Yes. <laughs> yes. United Nations Consultation on the Status of Women happens every year at the UN in March. Uh, the Anglican Communion presence there is the largest of any, any representative body that comes to that. Uh, there are women from almost every province of the Anglican Communion, sometimes several of them. They're supported by a group called Anglican Women's Empowerment that runs out of the, this part of the U.S. Uh, they're this year going to be joined by an Episcopal Church delegation because the Episcopal Church now has what's called ECOSOC status. We're recognized as an NGO of the United Nations. Uh, it brings women together to advocate on behalf of girls and women across the world together with others who are concerned about such issues. Uh, last year was the year of the girl child, um, how to help girls thrive in their varied environments across the world. The encounters that happen there change things in ways you can hardly imagine. Uh, women's ministries in many parts of the communion are organized under something called the Mother's Union. <laughs> It's really big in Africa and in some parts of Asia. We have a very, very tiny body here in the United States. The Episcopal Church Women um, was the, the, the organization that did that kind of work uh, for most of our history. And so the Mother's Union never got a foothold here. But uh, in Africa, the Mother's Union is usually chaired by the wife of the bishop, and almost all the bishops are male. 
tell you why. Um, it's the wife of the bishop. Uh, they, they look after the children in their communities. They work to see that the elderly are cared for. They're the social service agencies in those dioceses in many cases. The UNCSW is a remarkable gathering, and if you ever get a chance to participate, I commend it to you. There will be reports about it in the Episcopal News Service in March. Um, it's a remarkable change agent. Yes? Do you have an example or two of people that have been inspirational and successful at the second mark that you talked about in terms of teaching and, and uh, helping new Christians? Inspirational examples, teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. Um, I think the catechesis of the Good Shepherd and Godly Play are remarkably creative new examples of how to do that work with little children and somewhat older children. Um, the genius of that came, I think, out of some awareness of the Montessori movement, of taking children seriously, understanding that they have wisdom of a kind that their elders have often lost, uh, an openness to story, um, a willingness to see the world um, in metaphorical ways that we don't expect in children. Uh, uh, that, that's a really central example. Uh, I think the, the business of going out into the community, into the bars and sports clubs and Places like that to have deep conversations. That took a reimagining of what it is to be a Christian, or a remembering of the you know, the worker priest tradition, what began the Oxford movement, or parallel the Oxford movement. Uh, priests who went and worked in the coal mines or in the factories in England. Why don't we have people whose vocation is understood to be a Christian presence in the workplace? As an example, I'm a worker priest. Right. So tell me about your contest. The contest is in uh, leadership development. Okay. So, how do we form ethical, um, moral leaders in all spheres of society? Thank you. Thank you for your ministry and your witness. I do one more, and then I think we're probably going to have to quit. Yes, Is the National Church interested in promoting um, more informal, casual services with contemporary music aimed at young people? Ah, ah. Is the Episcopal Church interested in promoting a, a greater variety of worship that's uh, contextually appropriate? <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. Um, and again, I think it's going to require us to expand beyond those old books. Uh, it doesn't mean we give that up or let go of it completely, but we add to the possibilities uh, that are normative. That are normative. Uh, there are, I'm seeing a lot of experimentation on Sunday evenings with Celtic services, services of light, uh, that may or may not include Eucharist. Uh, another variation on that theme is something called Dinner Church. St. Lydia's in Manhattan was a, a, a joint effort of the Lutherans and the Episcopalians, and they started by calling people together to cook a meal, and out of that grew a worshiping community. Uh, being together is important. Um, having silence in the midst of our busy lives is important. And so the reflective Sunday evening meditative services have become really, the, the cathedral in Denver does one uh, that I haven't seen yet, but I'm, I'm aware of. Um, why aren't we experimenting? Um, the, the, the church-wide structure can encourage, but it can't do it. That has to happen at the local level. And they're happening in other languages. Uh, you know, uh, <coughs> I was in Caracas 
a couple years ago and was taken to visit a little Haitian congregation that had been formed from refugees after the earthquake in Haiti. And a deacon had come from Haiti to serve that congregation, and he's now been ordained a priest. And they meet in a, in a tenement, really, on the third story of a little tiny house in a rough part of Caracas, where many of these Haitian refugees have come. Uh, they don't always meet on Sunday morning, because that's when people are working. And anybody who does Spanish language service in the US recognizes that challenge. Often those services are held at times that aren't traditional to us. You know, Jesus didn't ordain 8 and 10. <laughs>